retired day school, entitled The Comeback of the Communist Manifesto. I think we all have heard the stories recently of the Communist Manifesto being the, what is it, the second most purchased book in the country. Tesco is now selling it for 80 pence. Um, people are clearly interested in trying to understand what the world's all about and seeing you know, what can we do about it. Um, we're going to have a lot of discussion today, lots of questions, hopefully. We really want to get to the kind of heart of the Communist Manifesto so that we can use the lessons in it um, in our lives and in what we do. So hopefully we have lots of nice questions. Um, the first session we're going to have is on history and class struggle issues by Kate Connolly. Kate Connolly is also a member of the Counterfire and she's the author of a wonderful book about Sylvie Pankhurst, The Soul of the that is correct. Which is, Which is available for sale on the um, stall at the back there. So thanks to everybody for coming from various parts of the country today. Kate's going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, then we'll go into questions and so on, and uh, hopefully have a good discussion. So thank you very much, Kate. Okay, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I want to start with the, the reason for the, the rising of the Communist Manifesto and what makes this such a special book, such a, a book that has remained popular and a book that people want to have and, and read and discuss. Obviously, Claire's just mentioned you know, the big sales of the Communist Manifesto when it was produced cheaply, the first edition sold out very, very fast. So what is it about this book? I think the first thing about this book is it was written deliberately and consciously for socialist activists. That's why Marx wrote the book. He was in an organisation called Down with the Communist League. And that was an organisation that comprised lots of different activists with lots of different ideas about how to fight for a different world, what communism actually meant. Um, and so, you know, there, in fact, there was, a, there was an argument just before Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto where um, they were arguing over what the slogan of the organisation was going to be. And one group said the slogan had to be, all men are brothers. And Marx said there were loads of men whose brothers he definitely didn't want to be, and he couldn't sign up if that was going to be the slogan. So these are the kind of debates they were having about um, that, what, you know, what were their slogans, what were they campaigning for, what were, what were their ideas. So Marx and Engels, his close collaborator, they wrote this book, The Communist Manifesto, to try and set out the kind of essentials. And I think that's also what makes the book popular as well. People, are, I think, are looking for the kind of essential ideas, what, what are these kind of key, crucial things. Um, but then what often happens, I think, when people pick up the Communist Manifesto for the first time is actually it's quite a surprising experience on a number of levels. For this book that's, you know, a handbook, it's a pamphlet um, for changing the world, we start off in um, quite a, a strange place. First of all, we have uh, the spectre of communism, the ghost, or as it was first translated into English, the hobgoblin um, of communism <laughs> stalking the globe, um, which is, is quite interesting. And then suddenly, we've moved somewhere else, and Marx decides to trace the whole of human history, which you might think is a strange thing to do um, in a kind of pamphlet written for activists who want to change the world. So why... Does this pamphlet start with an account of human history? Why suddenly are we transported back to uh, ancient Rome? Uh, why then are we in the Middle Ages or 15th century Florence? And what on earth is, is going on there and what is, what is Marx trying to do? Um, well, firstly, I think Marx um, is, is making a statement that we can all understand the world, that the world is a pattern, that human history is perfectly uh, explicable. It's, you know, um, and that is, um, I think, another reason for why this book is so popular. And, you know, at the moment, at a time when there's all these kind of uh, so-called new ideologies and, and things, these ideas about sort of postmodernism or neoliberalism, all these things that say a grasp of the, the whole complexity of the world is so impossible, um, you know, you can't attempt it. Specifically, you can't attempt it is the way that's usually put. Like, us ordinary people, like, no, no way um, is the whole thing explicable. In fact, capitalism, you know, has its own uh, mechanism, its own drive, and we should all just kind of go along with it. And maybe you might be able to understand, like, tiny little bits of the system, but the idea that there even is a system that you could connect up and, and critique and look at or try and understand in any way is, is constantly kind of undermined by that way of looking at the world. So I think that's exciting for people when they come across the Communist Manifesto for the first time. Here is somebody who's going, the world is explicable, we can understand it. Um, and if you can understand something, you can maybe start to critique it, you can maybe start to have the idea, you might be able to change it. 
But when Marx was writing this book, he was also critiquing um, ways of looking at history in his own time, which I think actually has unfortunately sort of, you know, continued on into the 20th century and into the 21st century. And those ideas uh, about history that he was challenging, um, well, you know, first of all, there was this idea that history was really just the, the actions of great men, which is still something that we're subjected to. Um, or that, that history is something that's just the action of great gods, that history just unfolds according to some sort of divine plan. Um, other philosophers tried to explain the way that society had evolved by talking about natural man, by going back saying, oh yes, we've got to go back to the beginning, but the natural man that they were describing looked very much like themselves, was a bit of a selfish little capitalist, um, who, like, funnily enough, was like, yeah, we need private property because everybody else is going to nick my stuff. And that's how we've got property, private property, and a constitution, and um, where we are today. And there's a kind of sort of end point in that, an assumption um, that, that basically, once you've got to these people, uh, people like Thomas Hobbes, that you know, we've now reached the kind of epitome of, of human achievement, and that is that is the king and, and philosophers like him. Um, now, what what Marx poses instead is a view of history that, that we now call historical materialism. And that, in fact, means that the kind of society that we have, the ideas that we hold in our heads, the dominant ideas in society, the kind of relationships um, that we have are shaped by what that society is based on. And so for Marx, that meant that you had to understand that how we were producing our own existence, that you can't understand society without that basic understanding of you know, how, are we, how are we kind of keeping going, how are we producing all the things that we need, what do we consider um, that we need in this sort of society. So, I mean, to take a sort of one example of this, if you live in a, a, a very kind of simple, um, early form of, of society where everybody is living off the land, where you're not, you're not able to store very much, um, where it's very, very basic level of farming before kind of it developed farming equipment or anything like that, you are literally just living hand to mouth off the land, then the kind of gods that you're going to worship are going to be sun gods, and you're going to celebrate the fact that there's going to, you know, there's going to be rain. You're going to be very um, focused on that. You're in, very interested in your in your harvest and, and your yield. Your relationships with your family are going to be different to a 19th century bourgeois relationship with with his family and his view of a a, a wife or, or what one might do on a Sunday afternoon, for example. Um, you know, this, people often talk about. Um, the way that uh, the Flintstones, for example, is the kind of opposite view of this. That you know, back in the in the Stone Age, that you know, you would just have like a you know, man and wife and their little kids and their little car and all this sort of stuff. Now, and what Marx is saying, obviously, is it's kind of exactly the opposite. That like the way that you produce things affects your relationships, the way that you look at society. And in fact, later on, um, Marx and Engels will kind of revisit those ideas to discuss ideas about women's liberation and show um, that the way that people were treated in society, the way that women's condition in 19th century society as they were observing it, wasn't a natural thing, wasn't something um, that just arose because that's the way that things always were, but they were tracing that to something that had historically been developed, that women's position in society had changed depending on what that society was based on and what roles people were expected to play. And therefore, because they'd, um, these things had altered in the past, they could be altered in the future. And that's another, I think, very important point about this, because there's a myth about historical materialism. I mean, it's two heavy words, which I don't think always helps. Um, and there's a myth that it's a kind of very deterministic way of looking um, at the world and the way that history develops, and partly that's that's the legacy of Stalinism um, and the way that Marx was interpreted um, by dictators like Stalin. Um, but I think it's also to miss, um, obviously completely misunderstand what Marx was trying to say, but also miss the, the idea that change is fundamentally at the heart of what he's arguing about how society develops, that change is essential to historical materialism. Um, you know, if you take, for example, the first line of the Communist Manifesto after the sort of introductory bit, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Now that's what um, Marx is arguing, that these phases of development that society is going through are always a contest. 
This isn't static things, oh, you produce this, therefore you live this way. That's a part of it, but these things are constantly um, contested. There is no kind of static um, state of being, like all the other ways of looking at the world that I've just described, that great men just created, or um, you know, that, that this is a, a divine plan, this is the way that it's always going to be. Now, Marx kind of, to get to this point, um, to argue this in, in the Communist Manifesto, that, that societies are constantly um, being kind of contested, Marx got this idea from a German philosopher called Hegel and kind of adapted his ideas. And what Hegel thought was that the human mind could uh, basically achieve a, a kind of absolute knowledge, but to get to that, we'd have to go through kind of various stages of, of knowledge and understanding. And therefore, at each stage, um, to develop and progress, it meant that always that was the next kind of stage of development was arising out of it, that those old ideas were being challenged and that new ideas would come to the fore. So there's this kind of movement in thought that things are changing. And that um, is what Hegel called the dialectic. That's a kind of dialectical view of, um, of how thought changes. Now, Hegel ended up being a right old reactionary. Um, so some of his followers, so sort of young Hegelians, are very much um, uh, kind of people, you know, students in the university, in the German universities, who, who kind of liked early Hegel before he got really reactionary, um, kind of adapted these ideas. They liked that idea um, of, of things being constantly in motion, uh, whether you could always see it or not, but they said, no, this is, this is always happening. Um, and what they did is they started to apply those ideas to human society. So take it out of the realm of just thought, so this is just all about ideas, um, but to apply that to actually to human beings and, and human societies. And to not start from the ideas, but to say that those ideas, in fact, were products of the life experiences of people, that your ideas are fundamentally shaped by what kind of a life that you're having. Um, and Karl Marx applies this kind of dialectical way of looking at the world to social relationships. And so when he says that the whole history, um, that all of history is, a, is the history of class struggles, what he's saying is that history is a constant struggle between the oppressor and the oppressed. And therefore, you know, it's, it's obviously the complete opposite of something that is deterministic. What he's saying is that change is based on human activity. Um, and probably the, the place where he kind of sums up, um, I think, historical materialism very usefully, this kind, of, um, this kind of relationship between the way that society is, but also the struggle to change it constantly. The um, motion to change it is in a book that he writes actually a little bit after this period. Uh, the 18th of May of Louis Bonaparte, where he says humanity makes their own history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. And that, I think, for me, is a, is a very good way of, of summing, summing that up. Now, there's another reason, I think, that um, Marx starts with history at the beginning of the Communist Manifesto, and that is to say that there are some very important differences that capitalism has with what's actually gone before. Now, this is another moment of surprise. Um, when you first read the Communist Manifesto, you read this thing and think this is going to be about communism, and this is going to tell, and then suddenly there's like pages and pages of like all the achievements of the bourgeoisie, and you know, when Marx uses the term bourgeoisie, what he means is the middle class, um, and it, it just goes on and on for you know pages. Like, there's a real challenge to all the kind of reactionary mystical ideas of the past. Um, you know, it's kind of simplified society, it's made, you know, it's achieved all these amazing things, it's built things we've never dreamt of before, and that um, always comes as a big surprise. And what Marx is saying about this is that capitalism itself, the, the rise of capitalism, this is a system that is inherently unstable. Um, this is a, a system that rests on competition, you know, within itself, um, competition between individual capitalists to make bigger and bigger profits. And therefore, it's in itself, it's a kind of revolutionary kind of system because it can't stay still. It can't, you can't survive as a capitalist if, if you stay still and, and you know, just make the same amount of profit every year. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Um, this is a system that, according to Marx, has to constantly expand. It has to always, and you know, when you read this, I think as well, the kind of, relevance and how much this applies to society, even more so than when he wrote it, um, is quite striking. You read the description of how capitalism has to find new markets, um, has to plunder new regions of the world to get, to get hold of the wealth um, you know, under the ground. Then he's talking about gold rushes and, and things like that. 
how it's got to break into those new markets, absolutely um, no matter what, how it's got to constantly invent new technology all the time. This is, you know, it's talking about globalisation, really. Um, Marx is talking about it in, in its early form, but this is stuff I think that is actually quite familiar to us and has shown that capitalism has very much developed um, in this kind of way. But then Marx kind of uses one of the beautiful metaphors in the Communist Manifesto where he describes um, this system um, as being like a, like a sorcerer who's kind of lost control of his spells. This thing has been conjured up, um, but in fact the capitalists don't really have control of this system, which is something that now actually is quite a familiar idea to us, that this is, there is no, they can't plan together because they're all in competition with each other. They can't plan for the long term um, because it's all about making a short term profit. So, you know, this is why we see things like, you know, them having no intention to deal with problems like, like climate change at all. Um, and so what Marx describes uh, about the system is that with all this kind of massive production and the new technology and the speed at which um, things can be uh, kind of mass produced under capitalism in a way that you'd never get before, you get crises of overproduction. This is too much um, civilization. Um, there's too much of this kind of capitalism. And then it falls into crisis. And for Marx, this is unprecedented. This is why he's, he's kind of started with the human history and then comparing capitalism with those other epochs, with different ways of organising society. It's going, the idea that overproduction produces a massive crisis in your society is, you know, this is something very, very new. And therefore, you know, I know that James is going to talk about um, the economics later. Um, but, you know, he then talks about you kind of get into this contradictory situation where then some capitalism has to be completely destroyed and annihilated. Thank you. Um, and new markets have to be found again. Um, so, and, uh, you know, and he says, in fact, this makes the system more prone to crisis because you're extending more capitalism and therefore crises are, are going to become more uh, and more likely. The system's going to be less likely to be able to safeguard itself. So this is one thing that's kind of new about capitalism. And the other thing that's new about it and significant for Marx um, is that capitalism requires a class of workers to produce all this huge wealth in society. Um, and it's this class of people from which the capitalists are constantly trying to, you know, constantly trying to squeeze them to, to extract more profit for themselves, which again I think will be familiar to lots of people um, as well. And this was, you know, as now um, was done then in, in various ways. One way to squeeze uh, more profit and the, for the for the capitalist, the owner of the company, the, the employer, um, from his employees uh, would be to start lowering the rates of pay. For example, obviously you can't do that forever. You've still got those workers you've still got to be able to just eat enough to be able to turn up again the next day. But that's what you do. You try and drive down um, the wages or um, you try and break up the tasks into the smallest things possible so that you're just, you know, completely productive. And one sort of nice example of this is that Charlie Chaplin mm -hmm. film, Modern Times, where you just, you know, poor old Chaplin's there, he's always, his only job is to sort of screw the bolts onto wheels and it, it just sends him absolute crackers, it's brilliant, and then he goes out into the street and everything round, he's just like turning all of these things. Um, and this is kind of one of the ways that, you know, he later kind of became known as Taylorism and stuff, but it, what it was about was trying to make that person um, almost like a machine, and Marx describes this very well in the Communist Manifesto, but also in a lot of his other writings, that you're just, you know, you're trying to squeeze as much production out of that person as possible um, to make as, as much profit as you possibly can. Or you lengthen the working day um, as well. And there were big kind of battles over that um, in the 19th century. And you know, this is very much borne out, I think, um, when you know, this, this argument, this is what is going on, um, when you know, there was always this claim made, uh, particularly in the 20th century, that new technology would mean that we all less, uh, we all work kind of fewer hours in the week and all this kind of stuff because we'd be able to produce as much as we needed um, and therefore we could all have a bit more time off. And in fact, what's happened is that although obviously all that new technology is there and we can produce stuff much, much faster, um, the working day is lengthened for most people. Um, you know, people are working much, much longer than they ever have before and that's all about squeezing more profits um, 
out of people um, for for the capitalists. It's like it is never like oh, you have some more time off. It's like great, well, you can produce some more. Um, so that's going to make me extra money. So th that means um, that, that this is a, a a system unlike unlike the kind of previous societies that Marx is describing because. When Marx talks about um, the bourgeoisie before they were in charge, before we kind of were living under capitalism, he talks about capitalism emerging under kind of old feudal societies where you have barons and knights and kings and this kind of whole massive, very complicated hierarchical societies. Um, and he says that even within that, the kind of early bourgeoisie, the, the burghers in Germany, all these, these little groups um, could kind of get together um, and they could, they could form... Um, guilds and, and things like that and sort of actually rise up a little bit in that society. They could you know, make some wealth and then they, they might be kind of um, quite well respected. They could do quite well for themselves, maybe grab a little bit of political power here and there. Um, what Marx is saying is because the drive in capitalism is to constantly take from, from working people, to squeeze as much out of them as you can, that everything is about that, it's about making more profit, that's not really an option for working people. You can't sort of then get a little stake in the system and be like, ah, oh, yes, um, this is, you know, I've now got some power. And this is, this is you know, really um, why um, Marx is saying that, that revolutionary change is the only option for working people. Because working people don't have this stake in the system, um, but also what you know, they've got no great reserves of wealth or, or anything like this. Um, but um, and so therefore, when he when he talks about working class revolution, uh, what he's saying here, he says all previous historical movements were movements of minorities or in the interests of minorities. The proletarian movement, by which he means a, a working class movement is the self-conscious, independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. And he says this revolution um, actually be becomes more likely, it's kind of these revolutionary ideas become more likely as well, because the way that capitalism is organising people is to increasingly gather people together in larger and larger numbers. And he, he says, in a way, you know, capitalism has kind of simplified society, divided society between <coughs> capitalists and workers, and that is increasingly going on, and workers being gathered together in larger and larger numbers, and that this is beginning to result in people seeing the divide in society more and more. And he, you know, he talks about how um, workers start to resist what's happening to them, and that this is um, absolutely a fundamental part of the way that capitalism is going to develop. And he draws this, you know, this is all drawn from experience and an understanding and an engagement with what was really happening in the 19th century. And he talks in the book about, first of all, you're going to get um, workers destroying this new machinery, the machinery that's destroying their own lives. Um, you know, and obviously, you, know, you can think of these examples in the 19th century groups, um, like the Luddites in Manchester, you know, went and smashed up that machinery um, that, that was uh, throwing loads of people out of work and, and ruining people's lives in, in a very serious and very devastating way. Um, but then he says that workers start to get together at work and they start to join trade unions and they start to you know, create their own organisations. Um, and Marx was very enthusiastic um, about this. And you know, he was in fact in contact himself with the Chartist movement in Britain, um, you know, a movement that, that fought for better lives for working people, fought for political demands as well, he was in contact with revolutionary workers in Paris, you know, went down and, and met them and was very impressed by them. And I think this is a very important part of Karl Marx's view of change, because at the time he was writing, he wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Um, it was published just weeks before there was an outbreak of revolutions um, all the way across Europe, so it, it was a little bit too late, really, because everybody was a bit too busy to read it in 1848, but <laughs> after that it got quite popular. Um, but at that time, in 1848, he was engaging in an argument with all these other socialist activists, and activists of other persuasions as well. Um, and there, you know, there were a huge variety of ideas about how social change can be achieved, how you can change history, how you can make things happen. Um, and some people thought, uh, people like Proudhon, who was a French socialist, thought, well, maybe if you could just set up kind of nicer capitalism, um, and we'll just set up kind of cooperative um, ventures and the cooperative banks and all this sort of stuff, um, and everything can be just apportioned equally between people, it'll all be all right. 
so that you could maybe do it within the system. You wouldn't have to challenge the whole structure of society the way that it was set up. Other people thought that you could just set up kind of utopian societies, um, you could find a little bit of land, um, set up you know, a, a really nice way of running things, and then everybody would just naturally see that's a better way of doing it, and they'd all be converted. Um, and that's the way that you do it, what were called the kind of utopian socialists. Other people thought that you couldn't really engage with the, the mass of, of ordinary people. They were probably too stupid, they'd probably give it away or something like that. So you had to have a really small conspiratorial group. Um, and that that's how you, you plan it. Maybe you plan a little coup or you plan an action and maybe the masses would follow you after that, but you held the keys to that and you kept it a secret from everybody else. Um, and then later on, Marx is kind of you know engaging people to think that um, that terrorism uh, is the way forward. That maybe all, all you have to do is, is shoot the leader or whatever, and then, then everybody will be kind of galvanised um, into action. Now, Marx, what he's writing in the Communist Manifesto, and I think the other reason that this book remains relevant and remains inspirational for people, absolutely rightly, is that Marx disagrees with all of these things. He takes it on by, by bringing this very big view of how things have changed in the past. And he says it's not about small groups of people or great men or people telling people what to do. It is about a battle of ideas. Um, and he says that change, his view of that change is collective. He, you know, he talks about the immense majority that has a collective view of change in the interest of the immense majority. And that is a democratic view of change. And I think that for us is a very inspirational thing for us today. I think that's a very useful thing for us today. Thank you, Kay. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm sure we've got lots of questions and discussion points. Uh, yeah, on Tom's point um, about, yeah, I mean, uh, partly, this is a book written to, I mean, it's a book very clearly written to inspire people, I think. Um, and so, yes, the, the kind of, oh, this is definitely, you know, this is inevitable, um, is, I think, it, it's, it's slightly, um, what's the word? It's hyperbolic. Yeah, maybe it's hyperbolic. I mean, he, you know, he does think it's going to happen. Um, you know, he is, he is saying we can change the world. He definitely thinks, I mean, the, you know, the word itself does sound a bit deterministic, but you're right, if you take it out of the context of the, of the whole of the rest, it, it sounds deterministic. Um, but, you know, it comes at the end of a paragraph and you can't go, past, probably. <laughs> um, it's going to spoil the sense of it. But, um, but seriously, um, you, know, you know, you enjoy writing. Um, <laughs> Way, you know. but, um, it sort of begins with this with this warning, really, um, and it, you know this section that you're you're talking about is the bourgeois and proletarian section of the Communist Manifesto, um, and there is a there is a warning in, in this bit where he says that this this constant fight that goes on between the oppressor and the oppressed ends or ends in, in the past either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large is obviously what we're aiming for, or in the common ruin of the contending classes. And that, you know, it's obviously developed by, by thinkers later on in the 20th century, people like Rosa Luxemburg, what she means when she's talking about socialism or barbarism. Um, and I think, you know, he, he does, you know, he does think that the proletarian revolution is going to happen, that the contradictions in this system don't make sense, but I think he's also providing a kind of warning at the beginning um, that there's a very high price to be paid if that doesn't happen. I, I think, you know, Marx was somebody who was saying this, this is going to come about, but he didn't think that the you know the first revolt was was going to necessarily result in a in a positive outcome, and that's why he's written this because it's, you know it, otherwise he wouldn't have written anything if he just thought it was inevitable. And um, he fought very very hard for the you know it's for why you know some of the kind of more popular biographies are like I'm just fell out with everybody, um, which he did. Um, you know he did fall out with most people that he met <laughs> and worked with. Um, but, I mean, and especially other thinkers. Um, and what that was about was he said you have to have the right strategy and the right kind of organisation. He took that very seriously because he knew what the consequences were if you didn't have the right strategy. If you were a you know, complete elitist and you weren't involving the vast majority of people, this was a project that was going to fail. You were going to land up in jail probably or exiled and this would have you know, terrible consequences for anybody that did have the misfortune to follow you. Um, 
So this was somebody who took that very, very seriously, um, and he, you know, he, he did know and he experienced very painfully after writing the Communist Manifesto that there were going to be revolts of working people to try and change the world, which ended in, um, you know, terrible slaughter in the revenge um, from a, a newly victorious working class. So um, that, I suppose, <coughs> is why it was that sort of nice. um, And Jack's question, which I think is really important. Um, about the kind of, yeah, all my brothers. I mean, what Marx means is, um, it, he's probably not even saying, well, we some sort of more reactionary minded working people. I think he's saying, you know, I'm certainly not a brother of anybody in the, in the ruling class. We've got nothing in common. Yes. Um, and, and it's interesting because what he talks about in, in the book, which I think sometimes gets misinterpreted, he's, he's very clear he's talking about working class interests, like what is in your interest to fight mm. for. And then sometimes people go, yeah, well, working people like, aren't always like that. Sometimes they've got racist studies. And in, what Marx is doing here is he's saying it's not in your interest to have any of those kind of reactionary ideas. But he also says, of course, that the ruling ideas of any age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. So he understands that those ideas pervade down. And for Marx, and I think for us as well, the kind of solution to that um, is struggle, is an attempt to try and change the world, is proving in practice that things can be changed and proving in practice how they can be changed. So, you know, if at work you're trying to win something better, um, you know, like better conditions or better pay, it's quite important that you argue um, that you don't belittle all the women workers in, in the union um, because then when you argue for strike action, maybe they're not going to want to listen to you that much because they might be like, well, he's a right or sexist and doesn't treat us equally. And if you prove that by unity in practice, which is the only way that we can achieve things, it's not just a like, nice moral thing, because it is um, morally nice to be kind to other people or whatever, but actually, if, if you don't um, have unity, um, or you don't fight for that unity, you're, you're not going to win. And I think it's about proving that in practice. And I just think, you know, really, if we kind of compare, obviously last year was the kind of year of the uh, BBC going on about UKIP, constantly in about the UKIP surge and all this rubbish. Um, but, you know, UKIP certainly was, you know, helped by the BBC, I think, but, you know, certainly was appealing to some people. And I think if you compare that with what's happening now, um, with kind of, with Jeremy Corbyn, I think a lot of people are, are changing their ideas. A lot more people are identifying themselves as on the left. And I think, you know, that is, has been part of a process. Jeremy Corbyn and his popularity didn't spring out of nowhere. Um, you know, it's not a coincidence, I don't think that's happened after 10 years of mass movements of campaigns that have been fighting to win people um, and have done um, to anti-war positions to make those part of the common sense um, um, arguments that people have in their heads to win an anti-austerity argument. So I think it's about campaigning and it's about struggle and people change their ideas when they're involved in that and they see what works. Um, and I think if you don't try that um, and you retreat from, from that, then it it doesn't work so well, does that make sense? Um, and then Ellen, yeah, I, no, I agree with you. I think um, the first part is much more accessible, um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, it, when they wrote, because the Communist Manifesto had this really interesting afterlife in that lots of other countries and lots of other communists in different situations wanted to publish it again. So there's lots of different introductions to it. Um, and interestingly, Marx says, you know, there's a ten-point little program in there, and he says, you know, to one of the much later introductions, he says, really, that was relevant then, but, you know, we say that things change according to circumstances, what you've won in your own country, there's national differences. He goes, that bit's not quite as relevant anymore, really. Um, and he says, but it's a historical document now. It is, it, you know, that was how it was published, so it's got to be published this way. But he goes, you've got to take what's relevant from it. And I think that's a very kind of useful thing for us, that they understood that, that it was going to um, kind of change. Yeah. To that. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, it has, as a, um, it does change. And then, of course, um, with the kind of, with the last section, which I think um, Chris is going to talk about, but he's having debates with other contemporaries. And even in the introductions as well, he says again, some of these debates are less relevant now than, than they were. You know, he's having a debate with the German true socialists. And there aren't that many German true socialists wandering around today. Um, you know, some of those ideas have, you know, changed and mutated in form, and we call them something else. Or, um, but you're right; that makes it if you don't 
you know, the context that makes some of the later bits a bit more, um, a bit more inaccessible. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, I, I think it's all kind of worth reading, and, and some of the critiques of the socialisms are ones that we are having today as well. So, um, yeah, but I think Marx's um, kind of call for people to take what's useful is, is also useful for us. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. That's a really great discussion. Um, where should I start? Where should I start? Page 26. Okay, yeah. So, um, yes, it's a beautiful piece of writing. Um, and what I think is particularly beautiful, you know, um, as, as you rightly said, there's, you know, there's a lot of Shakespeare in there, there's a lot of other um, influences. There's a wonderful book by um, Prawer called Karl Marx and World Literature, which goes through all, all of the literary influences on, on Marx. It's a wonderful read. Um, but what I love about the way that he uses literature he, is he, he uses it to make very kind of sharp and personal points, but he, make, he uses it in a very accessible way. This is not an intellectual showing off. This is somebody um, using the most beautiful and imaginative language, and this is written for activists. This is written for working class people in this pamphlet. Um, and I think that's a, 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 a testament about what Karl Marx and, and Friedrich Engels were about. Um, that you know they, they thought these things were, were very important. They thought culture um, was very important. Again, there's another stereotype about um, Marxism that, that these things aren't important. No, Marx and Engels wanted a kind of, uh, you know, they wanted a more human society where we could all engage creatively and, and, and appreciate the arts and all these kind of wonderful um, things and that we would indeed all be able to, to create these things ourselves. That was um, their idea of liberation. So I think it's a, it's a very important part of, of what he's doing in there, um, celebrating this, um, this literature that he loved and engaged with very, very deeply. Um, in terms of property, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's a good question. I'm, I'll probably leave most of that to, to James um, on the economics. Um, but um, but I think it, it you know it's a, I just want to sort of say this I suppose that yes private property is at the heart of Marx's understanding of capitalism. Um, those that have that capital, those that have property, are able to exploit those who have nothing to sell but their own ability to work. Um, mm -hmm. That's what goes on. Um, and so, you know, for them, private property includes the workplaces in which we have to go to work. Um, and then also, you know, he has this great phrase, actually, in the manifesto where he says, no sooner you left work where you've been exploited there, like all the stuff that you've produced, you don't get that money back. Most of that gets siphoned off before you ever see it. And then he goes, in basically, on the way home, um, all the, you know, the, all the other bourgeois kind of come and then take that, the rest of it as, as rent or, you know, the uh, food or the pawnbroker. And he says, this is... This is what happens. He saw it as a total um, system, and that I think is the kind of important bit. About, I want to come on to kind of everybody else's contributions, which I really agree with, and I thought were really, really interesting um, about kind of Marx's critique of other um, so-called socialisms and, and what's going on there. And, this, and it relates to this question of the inevitability um, thing. Um, which obviously, you know, I think everybody's right to stress that the fact Marx thought it was important to argue and to write and that he, you know, he did think there was agency, that human beings create their own history and there is a battle going on there and if we want to win it, um, we have to know what's going on, we have to have clear ideas. Obviously, um, I, think that's, I think that is absolutely right, but where I think Marx is trying to make an emphasis in, in that argument is on saying capitalism can't avoid crises. Capitalism can't reform itself. We can't do this under this system. This system is invested in our exploitation. It's not just an optional thing that they do because they're a bit evil. It can't exist without exploiting people. That is, is a, a fact. And, and that's something that people have to, to get to grips with. And that relates to what Tom is saying about um, the bourgeois socialism, which you know, which people have said about, about reformism. Obviously, here, Marx is writing at a time before the creation of the Labour Party, um, before all these sorts of things. But you're right, I think, to kind of link that critique that he makes there to kind of later critiques. Obviously, you know, it's going to change in, in some forms. There's obviously differences. Um, but what he's, what he's saying there is that these people think that you can you can have capitalism and just reform it and make it nice. And he's going, no, that is never going to be a key phrase, a kind of real cutting phrase. It's summed up in the phrase, it's Marx, the bourgeois is a bourgeois for the benefit of the working class. Um, and Marx is saying that 
is never going to happen. He's going to need a, a revolutionary approach to this. It has to be revolutionary change. That's the inevitable bit in Marx. There is no way of doing this under a system that relies upon our exploitation, and that's, that's the bit I think is important.